What is up, YouTube? Welcome to the Agroforce Academy channel. Today, we're going to have a special video for you, and it's a new feature in our channel. We're going to have this every last Saturday of the month. We will be publishing um, the Q&A session we had with our patrons. So we're hosting a Q&A session with everybody who participates in our patron community. And, you know, we do a, a, a chat together where we answer questions that the patrons send to us beforehand. And we're going to make it available to all of you so that you can watch. Maybe some of you have the same questions as some of our patrons do. So we do hope you enjoy this new new feature of the channel. So every last Saturday of the month, make sure you tune in as we will be posting this the Q&A session. Okay, you can check out the, the questions that were asked uh, here in the comments section. They're in order, so it's, uh, just, so it's easier for you to follow to see if there's any topic of your interest. And I'd like to take the opportunity to invite you to join our Patreon community. It's, um, it's a way for you to support us in our work uh, if you like the videos we're sharing, if it's if it's been helpful to you, you can join the Patreon community for as little as seven dollar ninety cents a month. You will participate in these Q and A's. You will get access to extra material that we're constantly sharing with our patrons as a complementary material to our videos to enhance the knowledge uh, that we're exchanging. You'll also be able to participate in the Discord. We have a Discord community. So it's, uh, it's an environment uh, for people to exchange ideas, uh, clarify doubts and all that. So it's a nice community we're forming. So do make sure you check it out. There's a card here for you to, to join if you wish. And without further ado, let's get right on with the questions. Forget about sustainability. You want to enrich ecosystems. Every bean is equipped to live a positive energetic balance. Keep it pruned. We are cultivating abundance. Not a problem to cut down trees. The problem is not planting them. Guys, um, let's, let's get going because it's, uh, it's already 3.10. I imagine the others will be joined shortly. So <laughs> I've got all the questions here in front of me. And if you guys have any more questions, just uh, um, type them in the chat as we go. And of course, you're free, free to just uh, shout out and, and, and say the idea is also that we uh, we not only are answering the questions, but we, you know, we can go back and forth. You can comment back on some questions, you know, let's make it a talk and not only an, an exposition from us. So, um, you did understand we're going to be doing this every, every month, right? This is the idea. And then what we're planning to do is that, um, on every last Saturday of the month, we're going to publish this video on YouTube so that you know, other people can, can watch. So we're gonna record it any time during the month. We'll, we'll, we'll schedule it um, on a regular basis and then we'll record it. And it, it will be our last video of the month. It will always, always be this, uh, this Q&A. Um, cool. All right, so let's get started, man. Um, I'm gonna start, since Antonio is not here, let's give him a, a chance to join. And I'm going to start with, uh, the, with Adam's questions, which he sent quite a few. As usual, Adam is a very uh, avid questioner. That's good. We're always getting lots of questions from you. I like that. Um, and then we can, we'll give some time so that Jack can join as well. He sent a, a few questions. So let's see. First, Adam asked, what are some easy to grow vegetables that can be eaten raw? For example, I've recently discovered long beans. Long beans, I don't know what this type of beans is, but I'm gonna search it, long beans. Um, specifically a yard long bean 
Super easy to grow and amazingly delicious. Most veg to me feels like it's too much work compared against the fruit tree you are continuously, continually harvesting from once established. Um, okay, so this long bean is eaten, you eat the pod, right? Yep. Can you okay, you eat the me? pod. Yep. Uh, but you, you do eat, you, you steam it, right? Or is it a... Uh, uh, you, you can eat, you eat it raw it? or you would fry it in oil. But you, you okay. wouldn't boil it like other beans with water. Yeah, mo most, most beans can actually be eaten like that. You know, you can, you can always eat the green pot. Uh, it's just that some of them, you know, if you get like black beans or, or just, a, you know, conventional beans that are cooked, they have very small pots. So it's, it's like it's, it's a bit harder to, mm. to harvest. So any bean that has long pods, even cowpea, cowpea has pretty long pods. Well, yeah, you, can, um, you can use them, you can eat them green. The pigeon pea, uh, you know, they're, they're basically made to be eaten green, you know, like uh, very fresh. Yeah, but then, uh, then it's the it's the the, the seed, right? The inside, the yeah, sure, yeah. inside, and and that's 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 definitely to be eaten raw. It's not a case of frying or anything like that. It's a lot of labor to open them up and you know bring them out the little green beans. Uh, that's Wait, the problem. But do you eat it raw? The the pig I never yeah. eat pigeon pea raw. We we usually like yeah. Give it a quick fry. Yeah, the pigeon peas and raw. They, 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 like we mix it with, with some ready-made rice or something like that. You know, with some, with some, uh, you know, those dried uh, grapes. Those. So, but the thing is, it's such big labor to be opening them and removing the little green beans. Um, you know, a little bit like uh, ervilha, a little bit peas. like. Peas, yeah, normal peas, yeah, yeah, just basically the pigeon peas, like normal peas. Yeah, um, I, I like to eat it uh, lightly fried and then with some, some cassava flour usually. Nice or as well. Bacon. You can eat that raw. But when we talk about vegetable, uh, even if you want to consider it a fruit or a vegetable, but tomatoes, you know, tomatoes straight away, yeah. something I produce here, like in abundance with very, very low labor, even though traditionally it's not low labor crop. But you know we produce it very low labor, especially if you you know if you're planting your tree see seedlings and then you're planting the tomatoes by the tree seedlings, just extra bonus, you know raw to eat, you know uh, easy to harvest, you know tomatoes. It's quite intensive because you know and and it's one of those things that it's not just a one harvest as well. Uh, it goes along with your question where you can have multiple harvests. You know that's something I always look at as well. I'm not really a big fan of, you know, coming in and just that one harvest crop, you know, um, even though, you know, it's the right time for them, like the corn and, and the cabbage and things like that. But, you know, I'd much rather um, some, some kind of, of, of kales, kales, right? Uh, that you can, you know, harvest leaves after leaf after leaf and it keeps them growing. And the tomatoes as well with multiple harvests and things like that. And then you've got um, a few that I, I really love, which are very easy and fast, um, are turnip, which is very, it's a very, it's very easy to grow. You know, it's not very demanding. It's highly nutritious. And the, of course, the root can be eaten raw. Um, the leaves, I don't know if they can be eaten raw. I've never done it. I usually steam them and they're highly nutritious as well. And it's definitely uh, one of the highest yields per acre there is, is, uh, is turnip because, you know, each turnip will produce over a kilo of root sometimes, depending on how big they get. And so they're very easy. I think they might work on that idea that you, you're trying to explore of direct seeding over the mulch. Since they have such a strong tap root, they might just dive straight into the mulch. It's something to, to experiment with. Yeah, I just, I just threw some seeds down a few days ago at my house. There were several different types of mulch, so we'll see. Cool, cool. What happens there. And, and then there's radishes, which are also very easy to grow, also can be eaten raw. And carrots. rockets also. Wow. Yeah, carrots. Carrots are not as easy as turnips and, and radishes, but yeah, they can be eaten raw as well. Hey Jack, how's it going, man? 
Sorry, I cut, I cut out here. You talking to me? No, I'm, I'm just welcoming Jack. Hey, Jack, how's oh, it going? All right, nice. Good, how are you guys? I'm sorry I'm a little late today, but excited to be here. That's all right, man. Great, great you could join. Nice, brilliant. Welcome. Um, so we're, we're just uh, talking about Adam's first question, which was uh, he's asking for easy to grow vegetables that can be eaten raw. And we've just explored uh, tomatoes, radishes, uh, turnips, and some beans. Yeah, but going back to the beans, um, Adam, yeah, but just a lot of beans that you can do. There is one called sword bean. I think we've talked about this another day. It's uh, canavalia, canavalia something. But it's not eaten. I don't think it's eaten raw, though. Because sword bean is a canavalia gladiata. I'm going to write it in the chat here. So canavalia, oh, Eric is gone. I don't know what happened. So canavalia is the same. Uh, it's the same genus as jack beans, right? Jack beans is canavalia insiformis, and then canavalia gladiata is sword bean. I think it's used uh, like steamed, so you know, lightly fried or something like that. And it's a very, it's easy to grow because it's, you know, it's kind of like a jack bean, except it climbs a lot more than jack beans. Or jack beans, they will climb a little bit, but Canavale gladiata will just climb large trees and then you can, it, it grows these huge pods and you can just, you know, lightly fry them and, and, and eat them. So definitely something to explore. It will probably work growing in your mulch as well. It's something you can you can do on the on the citrus trees. Also, you know you wanted stuff to climb your citrus trees. Definitely a possibility. Um, so yeah, let's go to the next one, um, Jack. But uh, since you you got here a bit late, I was just uh, reinforcing to everybody that we're going to be doing this on a monthly basis, right? And awesome. we'll, we'll be recording the videos and this video will be always the last video we'll be publishing in the YouTube channel um, in the end it's of the fun. month, in the last Saturday, right? And, but then we'll, we'll schedule with you on a monthly basis the day. It will probably end up being some, some Saturday, you know, one of the first Saturdays of the month and we'll record it and then publish it in the, in the last Saturday. Um, we'll keep the running list then. Yeah, questions. yeah. Okay, Eric's back. Uh, what about you guys? Uh, Gareth and Jack, do you have uh, other ideas for, for vegetables easy to grow and that are eaten raw? Spinach in New Zealand. We've got New Zealand spinach, which I don't know if we call it New Zealand spinach, but it's one of those um, plants that you can just keep harvesting from and it just keeps growing and keeps harvesting. And, um, and yeah, we that raw, but you can also steam it or whatever. But that's a that's that's quite a good one for New Zealand. Yeah, spinach is really great because it kind of like yeah. yeah also occupies that low layer as well. It occupies the soil quite nicely, and, and like I said, the the varieties that we plant here as well just keeps on growing and growing, and you can really close up and and block off all that weed. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good one. What about you, Eric? Do you have any, any, any ideas for vegetables that are easy to grow and can be eaten raw? Uh, I guess it, it's thunder and uh, storm here, so I was away. I, I, I'm in for half a minute now, so I missed something uh, because it's bad weather now. So <laughs> I cannot help it. <laughs> it looks so very end, different to 10 minutes yeah. ago. The, yeah, the electricity electricity was away. It's back now, but wow, it's, it's, not, do, can, it's not fun. I can I can hear the storm. I I don't know what is happening, but it's not good. <laughs> so I I think the electricity will fall out again. But okay, okay. Uh, the raw I have here uh, katuk. I don't know if I don't know if you know katuk. Katuk. Uh, katuk is. Uh, How do you write it? Uh, 
K A T U K. K A. Yeah, yeah. K A T U K. Yeah, I don't. I never heard of it. Star and, uh, there. Yeah, yeah. That's that's it. It's a, a sweet. It's some kind of sweet. The chicken love it. Uh, it's it's one of the vegetables that have a very high content of. Uh, 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 what do you say? Uh, not starch, but the protein. Protein. Oh, okay. Yeah, and we have the Okinawa spinach. Okinawa spinach. It's the. Um, I remember we talked about this in one of the round tables. Um, yeah. I think it was. Um, who was it? I, I don't remember which round table. Anyway, but we 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 talked about it. This Okinawa Okinawa spinach. They say it's very. Yeah. We have the vigorous. Yeah, Tahitian spinach. That's uh, a, a thyro thyro like uh, plant, but you eat the you, you don't eat the the corn. You eat the leaf. Okay. Uh, yeah, there are. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, there there are a bunch of. Of veg then there are a bunch of usually there's lots of of plants that are considered weeds you know that are actually leafy vegetables that we can eat as well they're you, you know very easy to grow and yeah also the, yeah. the the germinating seeds right the alfalfa germinating alfalfas and germinating beans how would you say it in english the germinating oh yes, yes micro sprouts, greens right sprout, the micro sprouts, yeah. sprouts sprouts yeah. that's oh. right yeah, the sprouts, the sprouts, that was it. They're really nice. I've, I've been, you know, I've been munching on those recently. Because, uh, you know, in the shop we have, we, we receive the things in and they've got, you know, sell by date. And so we've been having a feast here at home. <laughs> With all yeah. the sprouts and mushrooms and everything, leftovers. But as to the thing that you mentioned, Adam, about vegetables, they seem like more work than fruit. It's because they are. <laughs> there's, yeah, well, there's, I, no, I mean, there's not the, much the to do about bean, it, you know. The long beans that I have, or the yard long beans, they're so delicious. And they're big, you know, they're like that long. Mm. So easy to harvest. I mean, it's like, that just kind of woke me up. I'm like, what else is there like this? Like, I have some spinach. I have, uh, you know, maybe a third of the things you guys have mentioned. And, None of them have there, been like, wow, this is so delicious. Like, I'm going to eat all the time. Like, the long, the long beans have been. They're like, so I just want to try some more things that could be that easy. There is also, um, let me see how it's called in English. Uh, American taro. Okay, American taro is, uh, let, let me write the scientific name just to make sure. But it's Shantosoma sagittifolium. It's, it's, it looks a lot like a taro, the plant, except it's got arrow, arrow shaped leaf instead of heart shaped leaf. And you don't, instead of eating the corn, you eat the leaves. Okay. Yeah. You're not eat it, eaten raw, but usually just a light steam uh, is enough from, you know, for making them edible. You just, for example, one way which I like to do is just like if I'm making a stew, of some sort after cooking everything i just throw in the leaves in the hot water and that that already works nice it's delicious it's got n nice flavor and it's a perennial and it will grow nicely in the shade it will grow in your bamboo forest no problem in the middle you know it's a great actually ground crop uh which you can have just covering the 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 ground layer it's uh it's also pretty good Yeah, out of, out of these all, I see it's still my favorite. It's the basic, back to the basic. It's just the, the tomatoes. You know, we, we're really into our tomatoes here. You know, and they're really delicious. Tomatoes uh, are really hard to grow in Florida. 
Like there, there's an Everglade tomato that's pretty easy, but then you get, they're only like. Yeah, usually you get a varieties of cherry tomatoes. Yeah, like you said, the smaller ones, they're really resistant to rain, you know, but in the end of the day, people buying, buying them anyway, you know, because it is so difficult to produce like with all that water. So if you are producing cherry tomatoes, you know, it, it's the kind of thing that everyone eats. When we're talking about, you know, what, what do you want to plant? Me personally, they're, they're here in the, in the tropical areas, they're the things, the classic things that everyone eats because sometimes we plant all these fancy stuff, little stuff and you take it to the market and you're there, you take three, four of them and you come back with all three or four of them, you know, and, and it's like, it's this, it's this amazing fruit, but no one's really interested in that. And you're talking about the bananas, the tomatoes, the avocados, the mangoes, right? Uh, the cacao, the acai. These are the things that everyone wants to eat. So you see tomato falls into that category where, you know, obviously you need to have access to a market, but if you take 20 kilos of tomat tomatoes to the market, you're going to sell all 20 of those. Like if you take 20 kilos of bananas and things like that. You know, it's the kind of thing, there's, there's a lot of demand, and especially where there's difficulties in producing it in difficult climates, if you find the right varieties, if you plant it with low labor, and really be in peace to lose 30% of it, you know, it doesn't matter, you've high tensed it, you've not used any labor, there's lots of harvest. And then, if you say you don't have the right market, say you don't have, you can still make nice amount of sauce and store it for a long time, you know, the Italians do that all the time, they store tomato sauce for the whole year, you know, for, to consume. So, I mean, it's, maybe it's not for everyone, but tomatoes are still a great option and uh, it's still something that everybody wants to eat. Um, Adam, you asked the next question about the farm bot. I don't know what that is. Could you explain it? I couldn't see the video. Oh, it's, um, so it's this open source sort of robotic, planter, water, weed tiller thing that um, would go over a bed, like a raised bed. So it doesn't move around outside of that. Like it's almost like a 3D printer, how it'll go around on rails and then it can plant seeds and water stuff. And if it finds a weed, it can weed and kill the weed. The, the videos are really the, the best way to there are a few models of those. Understand what it what it can do. There there are some that is like a greenhouse and they, they control you know uh, even the lighting and there's other ones that are external. You know, Felipe, they're like little square um, vegetable plots and these little robots. They come over and they plant the things and they harvest the things and they water it and you know little robots. Obviously, I think it'd be really nice for you know if people are in urban centers and they, you know, they, they don't have any knowledge or anything like that. And it's, it's just, but what worries me is any kind of like uh, viability with the scale of it as well. So it's a start. Yeah, as, as long as it, if it's, if it's automatically doing work for us, man, I'm all for it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, if it's I, a I, robot that's going to do the work like for us, I'm, I like it. Does it as have long chainsaw it, as mode? long as it has quality? <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna change my my direction here, my position, so that I have better light. But that's uh, it, man. As uh, long as it's does quality question. work. When you mentioned sure, the sprouting, uh, like the microgreens or sprouting seeds, I wonder have you um, tried <sighs> that with? chickens to feed chickens at all like and especially if you've got like a, a um, area that's a little bit shaded or whatever and instead of trying to like grow a, a full crop just kind of having your seeds scattered out on your nice soil there and 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 bringing the chickens in when they start to sprout because it's quite high in nutrients isn't it when it starts sprouting yeah that would be real luxury wouldn't it i mean so that's that's the challenge for us to figure out a system that works, that you can, you know, replicating to feed your chicken quality food, you know, you know, like the black fly soldier production and like the sprouts production. So that's the challenge, you know, which one would work for, you know, how would you produce, you know, protein for your chicken? And, and surely that's an option. 
Um, mm. I've, I've never personally thought of that, you know. Uh, you know, you'd think uh, go go through the black fly option, you know, but um, it might be that it works very well. And and this is what it's all about, you know, as uh, experimenting with things that we think that might work as well. Is you know, yeah. so yeah, I've I've like, done some of that with sorghum uh, because if you if you're gonna do uh, greens for the chicken, you you need to have a, a cheap a cheap seed, right? You can't do it with with beans or maybe alfalfa. You can. Um, I chose sorghum because it's, you can get seeds quite cheaply and it, it is a way to actually enhance the, the, the nutrients, you know, the, the nutritional qualities of the, of, of the plant. I just and remembered right you, now, you actually. Can have, you can have very high production per, you know, per area. And I, for a commercial, uh, commercial production of chickens, I would actually considering doing it uh, indoors because uh, doing it on the field doesn't make much sense because I'd rather just have pasture because it's a, it's a lot uh, less maintenance and it's something that will go on forever, right? So you just have a good pasture and the mm -hmm. chicken will eat the green and, you know, move on to the next, um, to the next uh, um, paddock. Do you but know what I have seen? You can go have on. additional like tray you can produce it in trays so you like you can have vertical production of trays with with microgreens and then you can have like these like green mats that you can serve the chicken especially when you have hydroponic uh, yeah it doesn't have to be hydroponic um actually you 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 don't even need uh like water because once you soak the seeds and and they begin sprouting if they're in an, a semi-closed environment they will sprout, sprout and, and you know get already kind of big without any additional water and then you can have uh, I, I seen this operation lots of green for your chicken I, even during scarcity in the in the pasture you know eggs and chickens where they're doing this hydroponic uh, sprouting of corn right and people do it in, you know, they lay, they lay down, you know, uh, you know, mats on the, on the ground or they could do it in concrete or you can do it in the rooftop as well. I've seen it in rooftops, you know, where you've got those kind of waved rooftops. So people lay down the, the, um, the sweet corn, the corn. And uh, the, the idea of being hydroponics is that they can eat everything. You just pick up the whole mat after that, with all that information of all that root information with the green, new sprouts. So you're actually harvesting them like uh, 30 days like a full 25 centimeters even uh, with corn. There's an operation where they leave it uh, in water for, for something like uh, 24 hours and then they bring it out, you know, and then, they, and then you know, they throw it in, 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 you know, in concrete where it wouldn't be in soil, it would just be hydroponic. And it would have to be somewhere where it might be tilted where excess water would, would fall out so that it doesn't uh, have any rotten information find some videos of that and uh, post it on, on our uh, Patreon groups there in, in the, in, in our chat there. Uh, but that was really interesting actually. And, and I felt actually quite excited about that uh, at one point because, you know, you can use it in like rooftops, you know, and, and yeah. things like that. So you wouldn't, you know, maybe any, and it's, it's, it's such high, so nutritious, isn't it? And it can eat the roots all the way from the roots. It's, I remember that actually. Uh, still, no. still the yeah, the cool. the cheapest, the most viable green to produce for chicken is it's pasture, you know, because this is a it's a it's a it's a labor intensive operation that you need to do. You get very high production per per square meter, um, but that's it. You have to constantly be doing it. So I would consider it as a source either if you don't have uh, enough land for pasture, or as a source of of green for the winter or for the dry season, depending on where you are. Yeah. But, but even then, if you, if you manage your pastures properly, you will have excess food during the growing season, which can then be stored. So yeah, it's something to consider, but it, it, you, we got to uh, see how much it costs, you know, in comparison to having pasture, well-managed pasture. Yeah. I think that's the I only guess question. The, 
the angle I was thinking of it from is because you eventually get to a point where you're maybe in your system you've got shade and maybe too much shade for pasture. So if you've got your I don't know where you run your your chickens or whether that's in, only in the open, but if you have you know this lane in between your 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 uh, canopy of trees and and there must be like bugs and things that the chickens would would enjoy. But if you can throw out some some seeds to sprout a little bit, maybe that adds something to it. But yeah, well, actually, when you when you're running a system for animals, the, the whole system will be designed to maintain pasture uh, right. forever, like on a, on a on a constant basis. So there there are lots of of grass varieties. I would say most grass varieties they do tolerate some shade, and they will even enjoy some shade. So you know many grasses will actually. Uh, increase yield and increase protein content if they are shaded. Um, but of course, it can't be like a, a, a complete shade. You know, it needs to be more of that filtered shade. So whenever we design a system for animals, we consider that, you know, the distance between uh, the rows of trees might be a bit uh, wider and you will be constantly pruning those trees in order to maintain uh, um, enough sunlight for the pasture. So, and and, and, so and an idea. idea as well for the trees to be, you know, like forage kind of trees, you know, exactly. Like Ocayanas and, and things that when you prune down, it becomes feeders also that you're producing food within the tree lines as well. Yeah, right. That's the idea. Good. Cool, thanks. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm obviously as well, I'm, I'm on the mission to produce the food, you know, in the cow manure. But, right. but then you need, you need a couple of cows, you know, in front of the chicken. You throw stuff onto the dung as well. Yeah, well, you, you get the larvas, right? The, the larvas that grow in the cow manure and the chicken right. go into, into the cow manure and they pick up the larvas. So what right. people do, they actually throw the chicken feed on top of the cow manure. So that right. forces uh, the chickens to really break that up and, and you know, find the, their larvas in there. Yum, yum. Yeah, that's what people are doing, producing a lot of <laughs> animal protein through, through using the cow manure as a source to generate the animal protein. And yeah, then the chicken, yeah. you, you they're can going- send in the send in the chicken in the, pa in the paddock after the cows, you know, a couple of days after the, the cows go by the paddock, yeah. you, you throw the chicken in the same paddock. They will, yeah. they will even help decompose the, the, uh, the manure, right? They, they will help spread it, you know, nicely. So it's, a, it's definitely a good, it's not, yeah. it's not by accident that most of these uh, birds they they have a strong association with with big mammals. Um, there's a there's this sort of symbiotic uh, relationship. You know, if you're, you you see lots of of cranes, um, you know, hanging around cows because they will they will help each other. You know, so it's uh, these birds are always going after big mammals. It's a, it's right. a behavioral thing. Yeah, that's, that, that's part of the trilogy. Uh, it's so it's so much to it, but it's like there's, there's a few, a few like uh, cutting edge stuff. Obviously, it's all was done in the past through you know our ancestors, but nowadays everything's coming back. Um, mm -hmm. So it's basically you know the rotational system, you know the, the Voisin system, that's 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 key. Uh, the the forestry system, so you have got the, the forests, you know, so you the rotating within the forest, that's key, and uh, also you know the, the symbiosis. The, the chicken working together with the cow, how, how the consortium of animals as well, how that works. So for me, it's like a trilogy where, you know, different masters of each of those. And if we can get all of that together, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's the challenge that we, we, we're looking forward to every day. <laughs> all, right. <laughs> um, all right, Adam asked a question about biochar. So, said, uh, across the various YouTube channels, many leaders in permaculture, sustainable agricultural space, talking great deal about creating biochar for soil amendment. Your position is that you're better off leaving the original material to decompose versus first turning it into biochar. This seems at odds with what other leaders in the space are claiming, and it, it would be great to hear more details. Okay. Um, so basically, I think we, we, we were clear about the idea that um, for me, it's like I told you, I think using biochar is great. I would never turn 
plant material into biochar to use it. You know, I would use the plant material as you, as you stated here. And the, the point is very simple. It's the same with composting. You know, lots of people will um, suggest composting, but we're dealing with processes and we want to, we actually want to enhance processes of life. And composting and biochar, they will, you will, uh, um, you will make the process happen at some place and then bring the final product to your field. So you didn't stimulate, you didn't uh, uh, feed, you did not feed the microorganisms in your field. And that's the, that's the big thing I have with it. And I actually, since you asked this question, I, I started researching a bit because I, I've never researched biochar. Um, I, you know, I know what it is. I've seen people using it. I know it's great. And, and I, I've never, the, you can see that the reason that I, that I think it's not a good idea, is it's kind of, it's conceptual, right? It's, it's the concept of, um, you know, doing the process outside the field, but I got, I, I started researching some papers and I tried to find some numbers and I, I'm going to show some numbers with you. This, these are the numbers from one paper that I found. So it's, uh, of course, more research can be done, but just for you to have an idea of what happens when we're doing biochar. Let me show you. I stopped recording by accident. Now I'm back. Share screen. It's a very simple Excel sheet that I just made uh, beforehand. Uh, so here's the thing, here's the data. Uh, you, you, you had the, the paper, said they had a biochar yield of 35%. Okay, so of the initial um, material, you were left with 35% of the, of the mass, right? So from 100 kilos of, th this specifically was a mixture of wood chips, just for you to know the material that was used. So you get 100 kilos of wood chips and you're left with, a, with 35 kilos of biochar, okay? I have the concentrations here of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur. You can see here. Um, so, you know, uh, the raw material had 50% carbon, 6% hydrogen, 42% oxygen, 0.7% nitrogen, 0.03% sulfur. And biochar had higher concentrations of mo most of the, of the elements except for oxygen, which is uh, expected, right? Because you, you, you reduced the, the matter. But then if you multiply it and you see, okay, how much you know, in kilos do I have of each nutrient? So I had 50 kilos of carbon in the original material and then biochar had 22 kilos. So I lost 28, per, 28 kilos of carbon. How is it lost? Through gases and liquids which will either, you know, if it's a gas, it will eventually go into the atmosphere or in liquid form, it will stay in the spot where you made biochar. So you're losing stuff. You're not bringing some of that stuff into the field. Okay, so hydrogen. Um, I had six kilos of hydrogen in, in the raw material and I had less than one kilo in biochar. Oxygen, I had 42 kilos in, in the raw material versus seven kilos in biochar. In nitrogen, I have 0 0.7 kilos in the raw material versus 0 0.4 kilos in biochar. So it is a big loss. And so if, you, if, we, if we calculate the loss here, um, let's do this. Right, so it's 50, 5% loss of carbon, 56% loss of carbon, 86% loss of hydrogen, 83% loss of oxygen, 42% loss of, of nitrogen. And so far, I don't know if they didn't find in biochar or if they just didn't, um, didn't calculate it, didn't analyze it because they just, they didn't put sulfur contents for biochar. I would imagine that there was nothing because since sulfur is highly volatile as well, and it, it will, you know, go away through gases. So, 
you know, there, there are losses. So you're just, uh, you know, letting go of many, of many elements, many nutrients. And these are all, um, this is sugar, right? Carbohydrates, right? Carbon, hydrogen, and water. So this is feed for microorganisms. This is what they eat. So we're, you're, you're throwing away most of the sugar that's in the, um, in the material. And then, ni of course, nitrogen is also an essential element to, to, to feed life in the soil. And you're throwing away over half that. So, you know, it is great. Yes, it's great. But it is an inert material that will not stimulate life in the soil it will create niche for you know it will help store water it's organic matter it's carbon that you're adding to the soil it's concentrated carbon but the fact of the matter is you like you're losing some of the stuff and if you're if you're just putting that organic matter in the soil in high quantity um you will gain the same benefits because you will produce that black soil and just for you to have an, an example in Ernest farm they did a study of how much soil he was producing he was producing as much as three centimeters of soil per year because of all the organic matter being thrown in, in the soil if he was to turn that into biochar not only it would be unfeasible because the amount of organic matter is just so much so it's a it's just huge work. Um, he wouldn't be gaining that soil. Right? So we have to remember that the most important thing in our soil is it's the microorganisms and the life that's in the soil. So we want to stimulate this as much as possible. And we do that through constant input of organic matter. And just imagine that, you know, if you get a yield of 35%, you're losing 65% of that mass of all that matter. And you're losing water, which is also essential for microorganisms. And you're losing all the sugar. So, you know, you're throwing that away. So, sure, if you have access to biochar, to, to, to charcoal, if, you, if, you, if there's somebody selling that for some reason, I would buy it and, and use it as an, is, an initial uh, soil input. I, I would have no problem that, with that. But I would never turn it, turn my organic matter into into biochar to use it in my soil. Uh, I just recently had a, I, I was seeing this speech by this guy. He does um, like holistic management with horses in, in Ceará, which is a very dry region here in Brazil. And he doesn't even do agroforestry, right? It's just, uh, it's just rational rotational grazing uh, with horses and, and grasses, you know, they're, trees scattered around but not much and just by the input of of cow dung and organic matter from the grass itself you know that has is trampled on by the horses he gained eight eight centimeters of soil of black soil in 12 years so you know th we can do this in a very quick way and if we were to turn all that matter into biochar we would not gain that soil and so it's it's something that still doesn't make sense to me like i said it's just like composting people say you should do it people say it's good and the product is good but the process is better that's the i think that's the the key point of it very well said it's, it's the whole enriching process that you know happens on the spot where you the, the bio the microorganisms they transform together with the material so in the end you have the whole bed transformed you get all that microorganisms that was there initially and it transforms together rather than you know if you're bringing it in and then it's a big shock to the microorganisms that was there prior to that you know it's different material it hasn't it's like a, it's an end product and there's a bit of a shock and then there's a time for that those microorganisms to adapt and you know and 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 then you know create new fauna of microorganisms so once you've transformed it if you've decomposed it on the spot you know when, once that that decomposition time is up you've actually you've got a, a result where all that fauna all that microorganisms has already been transformed and and it's all aligned you know with the 
prepared. That was that was excellent there, uh, mathematically there, Felipe. It all makes sense. I, it's just, I, I, you know, people are saying the main benefit is like the the structure that you're creating. You know, because the the biochar carbon can just hold a, so much surface area for microorganisms to then colonize. And there's just so many people that I watch and learn different things from, and they're all like making biochar out of their stuff and. Well, that might be a really good opportunity for you guys to do some videos on that and maybe yeah definitely I'll, I'll i thought of making a video about it and i will i just want to gather some more data first you know go through some more studies so that i can actually you know sh show something more concrete uh, but then it's important to understand that most of people who are doing this they they don't work under the logic of a huge input of organic matter because the fact is that soil organic matter will have the same benefits of biochar. It will hold more water. It will have higher, higher surface area. It will have a higher um, CEC. Uh, organic matter has huge CEC. You know, here in, in, in the tropics, our clay will have, you know, ridiculously low CEC. And organic matter, and ridiculously low, I mean, like 10 or something. I don't remember the numbers exactly, but I remember it's like between zero and 10. Organic matter will have 2,000 if I'm not wrong. I might be wrong about the numbers here. I'm going by, by heart, but I think that's some, some, it's a huge difference like that. So the more you add organic matter to the soil, the more you're increasing that, and you, you're getting those same benefits that people claim that biochar has you know, higher water retention, you're getting carbon into the soil, you're getting, uh, you know, you feed stock for your microorganisms, which biochar is not. It might create environment for microorganisms to grow in, but it's not feed stock. Organic matter does both. And you're covering the soil. You know, just imagine how much soil could be covered with the material that was turned into biochar and now cannot be covered, used to cover the soil. So, yeah, I think, I think people are still, that's the thing. Most people work under the idea of an input agriculture. So they think that agriculture has to be done on the basis of input. So the more you bring to your system and put there, the better. We work under the idea, the more I stimulate processes, the better, because the process is the party. That's, that's where the, the goodies are. But I'll, I'll try to, to, to do something on biochar, you know, a more thorough video talking about it. It's a good, it's a good topic. Yeah, you know, with, with the in, agriculture of input, really people are worried about the minerals and, and you know, the, the numbers of, of the input. Uh, and, you know, we're really focusing on the processes of life of an agriculture that promotes life in the soil. This is the key. This is, this is where all, the, all our fertilizer will, will come from you know, from, from life in the soil. So, you know, once you compost and things, you know, you basically, you're eliminating life, you know, you're reducing life drastically. So it really goes against in many ways, um, some of our principles. Yeah. Um, okay, Adam asked about also vanilla bean. What are some tips for working with vanilla bean plants starting from one meter long cuttings? Uh, I've never grown myself vanilla beans. You know, I've seen, I've visited some people who, who grow vanilla beans. And like I told you, vanilla beans, they are, they grow in the primary forest, the tropical forest, right? So they are, they grow in the shade. Uh, they love to climb on plants with, uh, especially those plants that, that produce, either they have a bark, which makes it easy for them to cling on. And they might even, you know, uh, extract some nutrients from the bark or palm trees. Palm trees are great because they will create many palm trees. They will, they will have that, the, the sheath. Is that how you call it? The sheath from the leaves um, where they will accumulate lots of organic matter and, and the little beans will grow there. Let me, let me see if I can find some picture. Um, of vanilla beans growing on palm trees. 
Not sure we're going to get it, but I actually recently visited a place where I could find wild vanilla gr growing on, on palm trees. I probably have some pictures, but I need to, to search for them. So maybe for some other time, but you know, you get the idea. You, you want vanilla in a shaded environment with trees that will help it climb and will, will create like, like uh, pockets of organic matter so that, you know, decomposing organic matter so that they can root, take root and extract all the nutrients they need. Um, Eric asked about, what about the idea of planting dragon fruit and black pepper on the same pole or black pepper grown against a five-year-old and four meter sugar apple tree? Uh, the black will be pruned at the height of two meters. I think that could be done if you, if you're uh, uh, allowing dragon fruit to climb higher than black pepper, although I, and then, you know, making black pepper slightly lower. It might be a bit overshading for the black pepper though, although it will grow in the shade. You know, having a drag because a dragon fruit, uh, once it grows, people will, will, will uh, like direct the branches to form like a sort of like a canopy, like a mushroom style canopy. That might be a bit too much shade for black pepper. I don't know, but it's, uh, I would, I would think that. But you can definitely grow black pepper on, on five year old um, sugar apple trees, especially since sugar apples, you will be pruning them regularly. And you know, the, it will it will be taking out the leaves. The tree will pretty much be bare of leaves. You know, will just be the, the like the skeleton of the tree. So that will allow a lot of room for the black pepper to to develop. All right. So now to Jack's questions. Um, we're planting into an old cattle pasture that already has Mombasa grass grown. We'd like to leave the Mombasa grown between three rows, but in heavy clay soil. Will the tree roots struggle to grow beyond the prepared tilled tree rows? That's a pretty good question. Um, before we answer it, just tell me what's the state of the Mombasa grass? It is a, like, is it well developed? It is a closed, is it a closed pasture or are there lots of gaps in, in the middle? Um, there are, the, the area that we're starting is pretty well developed, pretty, pretty closed with Mombasa grass. Sounds good. So Mombasa grass uh, tills the soil a lot better than you or I or any tractor will do. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, what you do have to worry is, I mean, you don't have to worry about it. You just, you just need to, um, to do it properly. It's like when you do plant the trees, you should leave at least like 40, 50 centimeters to each side of the center row. And in that spot, you should probably eliminate the grass um, and use the grass already established it to heavy mulch it. So, you know, you just create, since you have a well-established uh, pasture, you, you can probably get like really thick 20, 30 centimeters mulch on the sides of the beds, right? Creating that nice, um, that nice valley in between the, the two edges of the mulch. And then you have your, your trees right in the center that will create an amazing environment for the initial roots to develop. Once the trees are well established, they will dive deep and go and they will, you know, they will sort themselves along with the Mombasa grass roots, no problem. Especially since you will be feeding back that, um, that grass to the trees themselves. So I would say that the, the most important thing is the establishment of the trees. So if you create that nice environment, you know, 80 centimeters, one meter wide um, bed for them to grow in, and that's nicely manured and you have nice mulch, you'll have no problem at all. What I would uh, say, Jack. Any, yeah, go there. Yeah, uh, um, you know, because I understand you've got your corridors for pastures as well. Um, what I would say, I think your, your tree rows would benefit greatly if you hold your pasture back, you know, for, for animal feed maybe say for the first year, you know, for a full rain season. So you can really 
use that grass to do the heavy mulching where you need it, you know. Really use that grass initially to, you know, feed your trees to, to block off, you know, the Mombasa grass in that, in that uh, tree bed, you know, for 50 centimeters on either side. Um, I know it's easier said than done, you know, like here, I set up my system and the cows are in it in the first year. But, um, you know, it would be great if you hold your cows, hold your animals, your, your, your sheep, goats, whatever it is, you know, for a year and use it, use that grass for mulching initially, you're going to really boom your system that way, you know, with, with, with less external input. Yeah, you, yeah and you, you brought up a good point about too, about the Mombasa grass tilling the soil better than any machine would. Um, but just in having dug up some of the Mombasa grass, it's interesting how the roots really don't seem to go very deep, at least in our clay soil. So I, that's what I was kind of concerned that maybe there was like some compaction. Maybe the Mombasa grass was just growing in like a superficial layer, superficial layer. And um, just kind of concerned that the trees would almost get root bound within the, the bed that we prepared for them. Uh, if they had trouble breaking out into the unprepared, untilled soil, but um, yeah, we'll you, you probably <laughs> have you probably have a, a, a compacted uh, um, layer uh, below beneath twenty centimeters. So for the tree rows, you should try to get a subsoiler. I don't know if if you can get that there. You know you know what a subsoiler is, right? It's an it's a yeah, tractor yeah. implement which will. Uh, it needs to be a pretty strong one for heavy clay soils. You know, I've, I've had the experience of, of getting a subsoiler and it, the subsoiler won't go into the soil because the soil is so compacted and it's a small subsoiler with a small tractor. So you got to, you know, figure out if, if it's going to work, but you want to, to, you want to break this, you want to break that, that sub superficial layer. And then if you do that only in the tree rows, um, that's already gonna gonna allow for for your trees to expand roots, you know, deep. And okay. as you work, as you work throughout the the years, and you know, you're putting organic matter and you're doing proper grazing, the Mombasa grass will slowly, um, you know, break those those that that heavy clay layer beneath the the surface of the soil as well. And it's also a good idea to add some some hardcore legume bushes in the middle of the pasture. So you know stuff like pigeon pea, uh, sun hemp, yeah. and all all plants which have strong tap roots, which will help break that 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 compacted is, layer of the soil. This is another point. You know, if if you leave the animals to next year as well, it's another opportunity to introduce you know some kind of hardcore trees in in the center there. Even maybe eucalyptus, you know, has got nice deep roots and, and then faster growing trees like moringas and things like that as well to, to break up that shade in the center. And then uh, I understand your next question, or I don't know if it's attached to this one, with the Mexican sunflowers as well. You know, I don't know how wide your pastures would be, what you're considering how wide, you know. But uh, you see, in my, in my 12 meters uh, pastures, I've put two lines of Mexican sunflowers uh, three meters away from each of the tree rows, right? So we've got we've got them three meters away from each of the tree rows, and they're six meters away from each other in the center. You understand? So there's tree rows, three meters, a line of Mexican sunflowers. Six meters, a line of Mexican sunflowers. Three meters, tree rows. So it's a 12 meter wide bed. Um, you know, and I could have put things in the center. I would have loved to put some eucalyptus and moringas in. I just didn't get around to that. So uh, how, how are your pastures looking wide-wise? Uh, we're kind of still playing with it, to, to trying to decide exactly what animals. I mean, we're, we have some areas where we want to just move chickens through in portable pins. So those will probably just be like regular four, five meter spacings. Um, and then of course, yeah, if we want to do cows, it'll have to be bigger. We also have some goats that we might try to do in medium. We're, so we're kind of still playing with the spacing. Yeah, so it'd be interesting if you plant something in the center as well, just to help break down that soil as well in the center, you know, and, and shorten your, your, your time as well. You know, if you've got something in the center, like breaking it down. Does Mexican sunflower have a strong taproot as well? If planted by seed. It no. does. Okay. If planted by cuttings, not really. Because any, any plant that you, you plant by cutting, it doesn't have a taproot. It will produce adventitious roots. 
I don't know if that's the name in English. It's in, in Portuguese. It is. Uh, but you can see wh when a maximum, when a, 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 a when a cutting starts taking root, it produces a bunch of roots, right? Yeah. From the bottom of a of the of the cutting, and then when when plants die cut at least when they sprout from the seed, they will in, in, you know they will sprout it with a strong tap root, and that will go down and re reach further. Um, you don't have to worry about Mexican sunflowers, uh, although it is invasive, it can be invasive. You just need all of these very vigorous plants and that have an invasiveness potential. They just need to be managed properly. That's, uh, that's it. You know, they will be your best ally if, if properly managed. And, you know, the, the, the animals will eat it. It's highly nutritious. So it's definitely good to have in your, in your pasture. I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't bro broadcast Mexican sunflower randomly. I would make very organized rows to make management easier. What I would broadcast randomly is pigeon pea because it doesn't have so much of an invasiveness potential. And you know, if you if you get a pasture of Mombasa grass, you just broadcast pigeon pea in the middle, and you cut the grass. You know, maybe a couple of days after you have a rain. Um, the pigeon pea will sprout and it will break through that organic matter on top of it, no problem. So this is, uh, this is a strategy you can use. And since pigeon pea, it's easy to eliminate. Eventually, if it becomes too dense, if it becomes too, too, too shaded for the pasture, it's not, easy, it's not hard to eliminate it. So it's, a, it's an idea. Perfect. Yeah, it's okay. really rich. And, and if you go through any drought, any things like that, you know, your, your pigeon peas and your Mexican sunflowers, they can maintain green for quite a while. So, yeah. you, you know, that's, that's animal feed there in difficult times. Okay. Also, if you don't manage to get a subsoiler or if you're doing a small plot, which doesn't make sense to bring a tractor in, then when you're preparing the nests for your, your seedlings, your tree seedlings, just make sure you dig like a 60 centimeters hole so that you okay. break, at least you have some some spots where you've got that that compacted layer broke, and then trees will will work from there. Okay, great. Um, so you asked also, can the minerals in well water fertilize an agroforestry system like the minerals in rock dust do? Most certainly, of course, uh, it's a very slow concentration. Depending on the mineral water, of course, it will vary, but it is, it's nutrient, man. Nutrient is nutrient. An element is an element. A molecule is a mon molecule. So if you're getting that, if, if the, the water is rich, so for example, if you get, uh, um, depending on the sort of rock that you have around, your water might be filled with some nutrients. They will fertilize it, but it's probably a very small percentage. You know, that's a very small concentration. But over the years, this will be used. It will accumulate in organic matter as plants absorb those nutrients and return that through organic matter. It will gradually enrich the soil, no doubt. Because that's something that's often um, recommended to avoid is what, use, irrigating with water that's high in minerals, right? Because it's kind of high in salts, I guess. Um, so damaging the soil as well, right? So I guess I'm just kind of curious, when are, when are these minerals good? When are these minerals bad? Is it the concentrations that, start the, that can be dangerous? Or is it certain types of minerals that are more, more of an issue? There are some, some types of minerals which have uh, like saline characteristics, you know, like usually potassium, uh, sodium, they will because they are salty so they will accumulate and they will produce salt and this okay. is uh this can be bad but this you know in agroforestry systems if you're if you're dealing with high organic matter production i would really not be worried about it because you're binding all that in organic matter and that's the beauty of organic matter anything that um that conventional agriculture might have problem with because of excesses you know excess of water or lack of water or excessive minerals or lack of minerals, organic matter kind of balances all that out because everything is bound into organic matter. So, you know, even soil aluminum, which is a problem in, in tropical soils, but organic matter will bind that. And you can have soils with free aluminum might, might just disappear from the soil because of organic matter. Um, you know, the, the thing is that 
it's, it goes back to that idea of the processes, but life is always working with all the resources it has available in order to make the environment better for life itself. So if there's anything in excess, they will work out so that that's not in excess anymore. They will clean up the place and make the place better. So I wouldn't worry about it. But it's good but, uh, to get a, a water analysis just to see what your, you know, what your water looks like. And also another point is if, you're, if your water is high in minerals, your soil probably is high in minerals as well because it, it was probably, it came from those the same rocks. So it's uh, not much of a worry. worry. Um, okay, so you have a four, the third question about Mexican sunflowers. We've already answered it. Are you asked if it's too invasive to plant in tree rows? It's not. Like I said, just make sure you, you cut it properly and, and plant it on the edges just to make it easy to cut. Because if it's in between the trees, it's just going to be more labor intensive to cut while avoiding cutting the trees, of course. And, and even, even, even when you're cutting yeah, them down, you know, they tend to you know, grow a little bit sideways, like bush-like. So, you know, if it's right next to, you know, it will, by the time you, even though you're going to cut it regular at a meter and a half, two meter high, because two meter high is still considered young Mexican sunflower, you know, fresh two meter. So, you know, do try maybe keep it like, you know, a good 80 centimeters minimum. So right on the edges, really on the outside of the edges, if you want to plant them on, on, on you know, it's just nice. <laughs> So, you, you know, like your machete is not going into your, your trees and things like that. So, yeah, you, exactly. can, you, you can take the challenge to put them on tree beds. Um, if you put them on center of, of the pasture, you've got more of a leeway. You know, you can go on holiday, basically, <laughs> when you come back and <laughs> because you want to watch out in the tree beds. But, you know, yeah, if, you, if you're disciplined enough. Any concern yeah, about... Can... Sorry, any, any concern about them taking root, the cuttings that, that when you lay them back down on such a fertile tree bed that you've been mulching or um, if that's such great soil, will they take root there? The they might. It's, 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 that's why it's, the idea is for you to cut it while they are very small before they, okay. they, they grow thick stems, you know. When, when putting them on the tree beds, I, really, I actually recommend you pruning them when they reach 50 centimeters. So you just, you know, prune them. Because they, also because in the tree beds, they're not going to stay for long strong because they will get overshaded kind of quickly so you know whenever they reach like one meter tall maximum you know 80 centimeters 70 centimeters you can just go with a and then they're thin they're very easy to cut with a very sharp machete you just you know just go by you can or even with a with a um, how do you call it that machine that br brush cutter uh yeah, yeah brush cutter yeah yeah, well, oh, yeah with a brush cutter and then okay. you've got those because the brush cutter has some forest discs, which are for, mm -hmm. you know, they're, it's a disc instead of a blade. And it's, it's like a toothed disc. And you can cut stuff with it without moving it around. Because with a brush cutter, you're usually moving from one side to the other. Obviously, that doesn't work if you're having like a, a if you just want to cut a narrow strip on the edge of the bed, because otherwise you're just going to get your trees down. But with that forest disc, you can just, uh, you know, do it evenly. You don't have to be moving it around so you can quickly do some rows. Um, it, if, it you come back and if, you, if you come back and you organize it, so, you, you know, you get all that material and try and make, you know, the bunches of it, you know, and then, you know, you can, you can be feeding back to where, where the actual line is or right next to it. And then, you know, move on to the next spot. But every time, high concentrated, a good 30 centimeters high, so, it, you know, it doesn't actually get that momentum to sprout because you've already mulched it off and, you, you know, blocks like that. Cool. Cool. Perfect. Yeah. That helps. Thanks. Um, is it necessary to tie up young eucalyptus trees that fall over in the wind or rain? Well, if they're too thin, I mean, any tree that's not strong enough to hold itself, it's always a good idea to, to, to tie them. But that's, I mean, consider that if that happens. It's either because the seedling was planted too old, so it was like it grew too big uh, without having enough um, strength to support itself, 
Uh, it's something that sh it's not desirable to having to do that. Usually when trees grow well, they, will, they won't need that. They will, you know, they will, will grow nicely. They will have a, a strong enough stem to support themselves. But it happens, sometimes it will. Um, so yeah, you, then you can definitely do that. But it's a matter of, of you know, checking it out. And also it depends on how strong the winds are in your place. Also, you, you know what? Very uh, strong winds. Eucalyptus do have the tendency to be a little bit weak. You know, you get, the, you get the best ones, which, you know, they do stay up very nice and firm. But they do have that kind of tendency in the first year to be a little bit weak. And again, they have a tendency to surprise you the next year and the second year where they really straighten up. So they do have the tendency to straighten themselves up. Uh, sometimes we plant them by clone and by clone, they're like, you know, they already start sideways. It's not like a nice straight. So, and then you're kind of worried about that. But in the second year, they do have the tendency to, to prune themselves, not prune, um, apruma, uh, to, to straighten up. To straighten up, to align themselves, you know, they do tend to impress you in the second time, in the second rain season, and then they, they all of a sudden they're, they're nice and straight. So don't worry too much if it's, you know, just, just help it out from, from bushes being around, you know, so it's not sucked by bush. And if there's any other trees in the consortium that, you know, any, any like corn leaves that's not letting it pop through. So just help it out, you know, and uh, trust the process that, you know, uh, in the second year, they, they really man up. Yeah. Depending on how bad they get, right? Because if they're like falling over completely, then it's... Uh, yeah, of course. They start sprouting from the middle of the... Yeah, then you, you then tend you to prune them and the let them come again. Basically. Um, but one it, idea... It might be interesting to prune them down. To prune them down? Yeah, it might, if, if it's already falling, it might, it might be interesting to prune them and, and let that one shoot, you know, if you see a nice shoot come out and restart. Yeah, then, then, then it depends on, on the, what you want the wood for, because if, you, if you're going to sell the wood, you lose the wood if that happens. So it's something that you cannot, you cannot do because then you, you'll have a bit of a crooked wood, right? If it's for, for use in the farm, of course, you don't mind having a crooked wood. But one strategy that will help also to prevent that is... Um, Many plants will not like to be buried too much, but eucalyptus accepts that. So you can bury part of the stem, no problem. So, you know, if, if it's already a, a crooked seedling, you can just bury it deeper so that it straights up with the soil itself. It has no problem with that because it will take root from the stem. Um, so you can do that. Yeah. That helps. Yeah, so, so do know not to buy old seedlings. Sometimes people are like, oh, this is a one-year-old seedling and they're trying to sell for more expensive as yeah. if it's better. The smaller, the you better. Know, so it's, it's not the case for, for you know, a whole range of, of tree types. And yeah. Um, Gareth asked, are there commercial timber production models that is for major timber markets? Yeah, definitely. Um, one thing it's, uh, which is important to understand, and I think this goes to, uh, Antonio question, which is good, good point because, uh, he asked what, what we're learning a lot about with your technique videos. Could you tell us a bit about your farms and business models? So talking about, uh, like business models and taking the idea of timber market as an example, it's important to understand when you're, when you are, you know, designing an agroforestry system and you want to produce something in an agroforestry system, you have to understand um, revenue per acre, the potential revenue per acre that your main crop has, because it's completely different. If you get wood, like timber production, will have X revenue per acre per year. And if you get vegetable production, it will have a much higher revenue per acre per year, okay? So this is important to understand the scale of the system that you have, to, that you, you need, and you have to understand the work intensity, you know, the lab labor intensiveness of the, the system. Because if you're doing timber wood as a main crop, you cannot have an intensive system labor-wise because it doesn't pay for itself. 
okay, uh, you know, it's, it's a more extensive system. So for example, I, I would, if I have, if I have timber production w uh, with fruit, timber is not my main crop. Fruit is my main crop and timber is a secondary crop because the yield per acre is smaller and fruit requires m a much more intensive care than timber. So, you know, if, if I was going to live off timber production, I would be, uh, I would have to, you know, to, to, to work on tens of hectares, maybe, you know, dozens, I don't know. I never calculated how much it would take for me to live off uh, that, but I can live off fruit in a couple of hectares. You know, I can produce decent revenue from that. And I can have timber in the system as, of a future crop that I will harvest. And when I do harvest, it's going to be a nice income in that year when I harvest. But if I divide that by all the years that I waited, you can see that the revenue is not very significant. So it's not going to produce the cash flow necessary to, to sustain myself. But of course, if I'm doing timber as a main crop and then I'm planting like 10 hectares or five hectares every year, you know, then maybe I can, I can produce a decent cash flow 10 or 15 years from now. So, so that's why one, we usually consortiate timber with animal production because then the animals, they will produce that annual cash flow and also animals, most animals at least, um, you know, like let, let's say meat animals specifically and big animals like mammals, uh, you know, cows, uh, um, rams and uh, lambs actually, and goats, anything that you're doing for meat production, which are usually more extensive. Um, it's a more extensive uh, production system, right? You need many, many hectares. Um, then it's nice to add timber because you're gonna have all that benefit from the pasture, the shade, uh, for the animals and for the pasture, and you will have uh, an additional income in years to come. So you get the animal doing that, um, producing that cash flow every year, and then you're going to have a nice solid uh, savings uh, in your wood for the for the years to come. So I think it's important uh, to understand that investment. when designing very low investment, very low investment. So yeah, that's that's the idea. Does so, it make sense? Um, just trying to uh, kind of imagine what that looks like is is that still like tree lines in a just with a wider kind of spacing and and across your whole landscape or like what would you how would you do that for timber if that was your like big secondary crop that after your cows or whatever else you're grazing well the great thing about timber is that most timber species they are emergent species um, so they won't com first they will not uh, compete with many of the other species that we, we want to have around for to the, for um, additional forage for the animals if we're doing uh, um, if we're doing them with animals so you can easily have for example let's say teak right it's a great wood it will it's an emergent species you can have it you know, spread around across the whole of your pasture in between the teak, you can have um, additional fruit, nuts, and, and leaf production for the animals, specifically for the animals. And, and, and these trees can be pruned every year. Or, you know, if you're using um, deciduous species, it will lose the leaves. So teak, for example, will lose its leaves if I'm not mistaken. So they will prune themselves. So that's already a, a it's like they, they will, you know, they will allow sunlight to come through part of the year. So this is a very easy system to, to have, you know, just have lines of teak and pasture in the middle and then uh, some additional species in between the teak to have additional foraging for your animals. And I, I would, I would, do something like that. Would you still limit their height to the same sort of uh, what, as you would in your more intensive systems, or would you kind of let them let them rip? You can you if you're doing a more intensive system, you should you should definitely limit their height. 
there is a question as to for wood production, if that's financially feasible or not. Doing it manually, I don't believe it is financially feasible. I've never run the numbers, but just by by intuition, I would say it's not because it, it is an expensive operation. Um, so for the wood production, although you do get a higher quality wood, you will get a denser wood, but in the end of the day, the you know the profit will go away by that yearly pruning which you ha which has to be made i don't know if it, if it if it if it is justified financially for the wood but since this is something we do for the system for the pasture for the my tr fruit tree then it makes sense to to yeah. do it so if it was an extensive system where i'm doing cows and wood for example i would probably not do that because i don't think it would pay then I would just leave them be and leave them grow to where whatever height they, they can. Uh, it, also worth considering when you're talking about timber wood, if you if you do go ahead and you know have your warehouse and you process your own wood, you know, if you if you make them, you know, into tables yourself, if you cut them down into squares, if you basically if you if you process your own wood, then then that's where you, maybe you can, you know. That, that kind of process can be viable where you have a much higher margin rather than if you're selling it to a company all very at a very rough raw kind of material. So if you process your own wood, you know, you, you, you there's potential there to make much higher margins, right? right. That, that's the point as well. Um, there's a lot of bureaucracy. There's, there's a lot of, you know, uh, you know, basically the government want their share. It's not so easy for you to, it's not just buying the equipment out here anyway. It's not just a case of buying the equipment and setting up the warehouse. Um, yeah. But uh, so, so that, that's the point. Another point um, when we're talking about, you know, the markets, you know, the kind of different types of markets. For me here, I've realized that there's an opportunity with, with you know, forests for the animal, you know, with, with revenue in the farm with, through animal production, you know, like be it, you know, chicken eggs and chicken meat or cow dairies or whatever, uh, simply because they, there are already lots of vegetable organic producers, right? There's high competition. So sometimes, you know, if both of them add up the maths, sometimes you might, you might make a decision as well with, with, with the, the bigger niche in the market. So for sure, you know, if, if I look around here right now, you know, we've got the shop and, you know, I've got everyone's list of what everyone's producing. So I can buy this and that of, you know, whoever everyone's producing the same things. And people tend to be competing on the same kind of vegetables. You know, everyone's got eggplants. Everyone's got aubergine. Everyone's got cassavas. Everyone's got this and that, you know, lettuce and rocket. You know, not everyone has, you know, organic milk. Not everyone has, you know, free range chicken, even though, Every time, you know, as the years go by, you, you, you find, you know, you're starting to find, you know, sustainable uh, dairy products and sustainable, you know, meat products, but it's still a much bigger uh, gap in the, in the market. It's still a lot more exclusive than if you just got organic courgettes, let's say, you see. So, so for that reason, you know, if I've got my milk in the market, it's like basically I don't even have to, you know, it doesn't even get to the shop basically. People won't let me take it to the shop. That's, it just sells so quick. Like, you know, I just literally don't have to tell everyone about it because everyone wants it. And it's different if you've got like a veg and sometimes depending on, on the culture around you, if you know, people are, you know, if there's a lot of people producing veg, organic veg already, you know, there's higher competition you know, in the stool, in the market, and things like that, right? Yeah. Yeah, that makes total um, sense. <laughs> yeah. Um, we can talk more about um, the business models in the next Q and A. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna consider this question saved, so we can talk more about it in the next one, because I think there's a lot we can explore, and it would be good for Antonio to be here. Although, of course, he can watch the video later, but uh, since he not, he's not here, I can. And then Gennaro talked a bit about his business model. I can explore mine a bit. And so, yeah, but I'll, I'll leave it for next time since we're already running for an hour and a half.
Uh, we're going to get one last question from Jack. He asked, Jonara, actually, you take this one since it's about drip tape. Uh, you're more into right. drip. I mean, being... how do you prevent roots from growing into drip tapes? Is it necessary during each pruning to lift the drip tape to the top of the new pile of organic matter? Yeah, we, we like to have, you know, because there, there are systems where you bury the drip tape, um, but that doesn't work with organic, right? Because in, in monoculture, they bury it, they, there are ways of burying it, but then they, they put the you know, poison in the water and that kills off the roots and, and then, you know, frees up all the, all the, all the drips. Uh, so it's not the case. So, so we, we do have it on top of the organic matter. And every time we're going to organize, because drip tapes as well, if you don't look after them, they get cut up very, very easily with machetes. So every time I'm going to go in and I'm going to cut, you know, uh, the, Mom the Mombasa grass or the Guinea grass on the edges or w whatever it will be, you're going to, you know, go in and cut the Mexican sunflowers or do some of the weeding. First thing we do is always take out the tape of the system. And then, you know, and then if you're doing the, the pruning, yeah, if, if you want to throw in some manure, if you want to do any of, of the weeding, if you want to put it you know, prune down all your trees and lay all that organic matter. And then yes, come back last, but not, but not least, you know, at, at the very end, bring the, the tapes back. Obviously people, you know, there's different levels of care, you know, people ripping them out, you know, just making big piles of them. And then, you know, it might last just one or two years, but you can make them last, you know, three or four or five years. If you do look after them, you know, th th there are fancy ways where you can, you know, get them into those rounds, you know, we can like, we can like uh, bring them in as if there was a, hoe, a hose, you know, you understand that kind of system where you, where you, where you hoeing it in and then you keeping it nice and round without all the twists and things like that. That's really nice. You can kind of man make that in your own farm. Um, it's really difficult. It's, it's, it's kind of labor on the arms when you, when you have like a, a, a branch, and then you tie it up and then you kind of like roll it up in the branch. But you know what? I tell you now, that muscle there, <laughs> that, I mean, it hurts. You know, it hurts. This is one of those like Bruce Lee exercises. Like, um, <laughs> so I'd really get one of those with a nice stick on that. So just do be careful how you rip them out, you know. Yeah. And, well, and store also, them. If you do have... Uh, a, a well-established rainy season, like as Gennaro has in Brasilia. Whenever it starts to rain, you just you know pull them back, and that's probably that's when you're going to have most of the cutting and organ uh, and organic matter uh, happening throughout the year is during the, the the rainy season. Of course, it happens also during the dry season, but it's just less frequent. So you know, if the rainy season started, just you know roll everything up and you know keep them stored and do everything you have to do and then bring them back when you need so that's an idea if it's not the kind of thing of course if you're running a vegetable system um it will happen sometimes that in the middle of the rainy season you get two weeks without rain and then you you kind of quickly have to to put them back again so that might be a problem but if you already have an established fruit system that you know two weeks without irrigation will, won't be a problem you can just, you know, really take them out during the rainy season and just bring them back in the, in the dry season. And, and as the years roll on, uh, you know, I've got four-year-old systems, which this was the first year I, I didn't give any irrigation during the drought, you know, because things will mature. You've already accumulated so much organic matter. Things are shaded out. And then eventually your systems can go through the drought. And then that's when I've removed the drip tapes altogether. Yeah, that's the end goal in it, in it all, right? Yeah. Exactly. That's the end goal. That's, that's realistic, you know, with your, with your fourth year. Yeah, definitely. Um, cool. All right, guys, so let's wrap it up. Um, thank a lot for participating. Uh, unfortunately, Antonio didn't make it. He seems like a very busy guy. He's always... Uh, having to do a bunch of stuff and he's got a couple from, of kids, right? He's got a couple of kids, you know, he has to run from the, from the Spanish inquisition with the coronavirus thing now because of the, the lockdowns. So 
But you know, if it wasn't everything international... is all right over there because things in Spain sounded kind of crazy in the past couple of weeks. But let's hope no, everything is fine. No, and Antonio, and if it wasn't the football international break, I would have said that you know, Atletico is on TV. So, you know, if he's a diehard fan, he'll he'll just <laughs> rather watch it later. Watch yeah, our I mean, Q&A, I think it will be like to second plan when it comes down to Atletico. Yeah. Yeah. The Madrid boys, they're, they're diehard fans. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a pity Eric, Eric had to leave as well because of the storm. But that's it. So, you know, thanks a lot for participating. It was pretty great. You can already start, um, you know, writing down questions for next, the next Q&A. And of course, there's the Discord group. We can always be chatting there. And How about, uh, we, we can discuss this further, but we, we could settle on maybe the second Saturday of every month for the Q&A. We can Fine think of me. something Fine like that. So, yeah. so people already know, you know, we can still plan cool. ahead and things like that. Sounds, sounds good. Uh, sounds sounds, sounds good. good. Yeah. It will always be this, at this time because I think it's the one that uh, um, accommodates most time zones. Um, so, yeah. All right, guys. So and thanks we'll, a lot. We'll thank talk you. to each other soon. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Take care. Cheers. Good to see you guys once again. Bye-bye. See you guys soon. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye-bye.